Welcome, welcome to the Rick Elts Real Estate Show. This is where we take a look at the numbers around Arizona, see if we spot anything. <clears throat> we look at trends, we look at our current data, <clears throat> we do a little bit of forecasting, going out 30, 60, 90 days. We talk about what happened last year, the year before that, see if we can spot any trends. And with all of this knowledge, not only will you understand the real estate market, but you will be a hit at all the cocktail parties. Now, if that's useful, hit that like button because it's been neglected lately. So, let's go, boys, said RGB. R -G RPG. That's a little different than RGB. Isn't RGB a... Uh, has something to do with uh, video cards on a computer or something? So... <laughs> I'm sure uh, RPG is much different. So anyway, so what's going on? We're starting to see signs of some cooling. Now, let me caution you because cooling, the market right now is hot enough to melt steel. So cooling from that temperature, we still have a long way to go. And I saw a post on social media yesterday afternoon from communication from one real estate agent to another. I don't know what real estate market this is, but it sounds pretty typical of what we what we see here so I want to read what it says it's very interesting and the agent says although we cannot share the sales price until close we want to give you and your buyer some information on what was received I have no idea how long they left this home on the market either it must have been a few days 48 offers received by deadline four offers had zero days to inspect the property 20 offers had zero days to negotiate repairs 10 offers were cash Nine offers used appraisal gap language. In other words, if it doesn't appraise for this, my offer price is here, we'll cover the gap. Fourteen offers had no appraisal contingency, so they said, oh, we don't care where the price is at, we'll bring in the rest of the cash. I know this market is tough, but I do hope this information helps with your buyers. Yeah, the buyers are going to go, I can't stand this. This is killing me. And that's typical of what's going on out there. I've got my mic running a little hot here. That's that's. I call it the year of the buyer beatdown. We need some relief. And imagine being the listing agent and you've got to go through 48 offers. You know, you're not just looking at one page, looking at a price and then pulling out the next form and looking at one page. You're looking at several pages of what the price is, what the down payment is, what kind of finance do they have? Um, how long do they want to close? Are they going to um, issue any uh, appraisal gap language? You go on and on page by page and then you look at the pre-qualification form from the lender how qualified are they how strong are they and that's one next you do the next one and you got 48 offers i don't know i'm glad that wasn't my listing that's it's not fun and again like i said the other day everybody said oh you real estate agents must really be enjoying this market no it's awful so what's going on let's jump right to it and then i'm going to talk about some changes in short-term rentals so if you're buying an airbnb or you own one stay tuned Cromford Market Index, this is a daily look at the index. And look at that. Look at that, folks. It's trending down. Now, don't get too giddy. I'm going to show you why in a minute. But this is a good sign. It's trending down. What I'm seeing in my seven-day moving average is contracts coming down. We're still only sitting at 4,600 homes on the market today. And we had 3,700 homes come on and a little more than 3,700 homes go under contract. So supply is still the major driver in price appreciation. But you can see a little downturn here. And it's not major because, you know, we had a downturn just, you know, a couple weeks ago. About the same. So it could turn. And then if you look at the average here on the red line going straight across, we certainly haven't dipped far below that average. Ignore these big dips. These are holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, so uh, or Christmas, New Year's. So that... If this continues to go down and the blue line goes up, that's a game changer. And RPG has a comment here. He says, I own a rental property. I'm looking to make another purchase. But after my refinance, I'm a bit limited. Is it worth investing in Central Phoenix for rentals? Is crime a problem? We're not allowed to talk about crime as real estate agents. We can only refer you to uh, crime reports. I mean, certainly some there's some neighborhoods that I wouldn't walk my dog at night. Then there's neighborhoods that are fabulous. So... Uh, the rental market's still extremely strong. That's all I can tell you there. Um, now, let me dig into some details here. Um, Cromford Market Index, this is weekly. And this is last year, 2021. And look at this. We're turning down. We have been following almost 
day by day right with last year. And here is 2020. So 2020, we were way down here. Now, the other day on Monday, we talked about 2005, 2006, some of the indications that showed that pricing was going to take a huge hit. So let's take a look at 2005 now and compare it to where we're at today. They started a lot lower. So we're starting here at a Crawford index of 474. And down here in 2005, they were starting at 225. And long around March after spring, it started dipping greatly down here. Got down to 146. But oddly, look what happened after that. It started climbing back up. So that would add some optimism. It says, oh, prices are going to going to start going back up again. Well, they already were. They're going up like crazy because this was the beginning of the silly season on being able to get a loan by just uh, fogging up a mirror. So everybody was jumping out and buying homes like crazy. And this index was based on purchase volume and supply. So while supply was climbing, the purchase volume was starting to go nuts at the end of 2005. But then we got to 2006 and everything fell off the map. Look at this. We end up down here in the 80s, 60s. 40s. So those of you that know the Cromford Market Index know that anything below 100 is a buyer's market, not a seller's market. And it just crashed. And it crashed to where 2008, look at that, we're down in the, almost the 20s. So this little slight downturn right here, while it's hopeful, um, it certainly isn't a uh, cause to say if you're selling, oh my gosh, I better hurry up. You've got plenty of time. Uh, this last shakeout took a couple of years. This is just an indication that things are starting to turn a little bit. The other indication that we're seeing is this. And this is mortgage apps keep dropping, but purchases outperform. Uh, we're still got a lot of homes going, going under contract. But the mortgage application volume has dropped. And it says here, it decreased 5.4% seasonally adjusted basis from one week earlier. So week to week, 3% on a non-adjusted basis. Um, then they kind of throw some numbers in that get a little confusing. Seasonally adjusted purchase increase, increase index, can't talk this morning, decreased 1%, although it was 5% higher on an unadjusted basis. It declined 7% compared to the same week one year ago. So I'm not sure what it is, whether it's 5% or 7%, but the bottom line is uh, um, applications are down. And the big reason is this one right here. Look at the top there, 4.12%. So now I had an agent call me. Uh, we're in the middle of a deal. And she says, has your buyer locked their loan yet? And I said, well, I don't know. That's between them and their lender. Well, I'd tell, I'd tell him to lock his loan because um, if, this, uh, if Russia invades Kuwait, rates are going to skyrocket. And I'm quietly thinking to myself, you know, if we have a war breakout, there's going to be a flight to safety and the money's going to go into the bond market. Bond market's going to rise. Rates are going to drop. And I said, Thank you. I'll pass that along. So yesterday, Russia says they're pulling their troops back. What happened to rates? They went up. So I thought, okay, that correlation may be correct. I'm certainly not hoping for a war to lower rates, but I thought that was a very curious look at the market. Everybody has an opinion, including me, and it usually gets us all in trouble. <laughs> so short-term rentals. What do you need to know about HOAs and short-term rental laws in Arizona? Now I bring this up. Because the winds are blowing and people are getting a little tired of some of the activity in the neighborhoods that have a lot of HOAs. So you are not HOAs, but uh, short-term rentals, Airbnb. And uh, can HOAs restrict short-term rentals in Arizona? This is important. So if you've got a condo or you've got a townhome and you just bought it and you want to make it an Airbnb, can they swoop in and tell you no? And it says here... The Arizona Plan Community Act Condominium Act provides that associations may only regulate short-term rentals in the Declaration of Covenants Restrictions, CCNRs, if it contains a restriction prohibiting rentals or providing that rentals must be of a certain duration. Example of a short-term rental restriction we often see is a provision that a property may not be leased for less than 30 days. If your CCNRs are silent on rental restrictions, there are no rental restrictions. That's important because it says rental restrictions may no, only be added to the CCRs by amendment. Rentals cannot simply be restricted by rule or regulations passed by the board. It must be in the CCRs. So in other words, 
They can't just hold a meeting in the clubhouse and say, we're going to restrict rentals, no longer going to allow Airbnbs. It's got to be in the CCNRs by amendment. When you're purchasing a condominium and you want to use it as a short-term Airbnb, make sure you get a copy of the CCNRs to see if there's any language in there. Uh, because that can really bite you and you don't want to get something that you want to use as short term and have it come up that you can't do anything. Now, what's going on right now? There are communities that are complaining. In 2016, the governor issued a declaration that says that cities, municipalities can't regulate short term rentals. He did that because he wanted to make sure that we didn't stomp on individual property rights and that people could have the opportunity to make money off of their properties and he liked the entrepreneurial spirit so he said i don't want this squished you can't do it it kind of had unintended consequences so what was happening you have these neighborhoods like arcadia where you got this beautiful house somebody puts on an airbnb and let's say it's a four-bedroom house 30 people show up you got six to eight cars in a quiet street they're partying at night people started complaining there was really no way to regulate it or you could call the police and say hey you know, the neighbors are being noisy, but there were no restrictions as to how many people could be in that house. So there's some language starting to be put in by municipalities now that they're going to try because they're going to change the state law. I'm going to show you in a second here that there can be restrictions to how many people can be in the house. And I've seen it time and time again where you see a Airbnb that says sleeps six people and 15 show up. You go to San Diego, you see that all the time. Now, San Diego's really clamping down. Uh, but there are several states that have no restrictions, just like Arizona. Sedona's having a problem. Um, Sedona's got a problem. They have 1,100 Airbnbs up there. I keep calling them Airbnbs, but there's Airbnb and VRBO. So we'll just refer to them as short-term rentals. 1,100 of them in that town. And um, what they're finding is their quiet little streets are turning into little party havens. A lot of cars showing up, way more people in the house than what should be there. And it's hurting the resale market. People are gobbling them up, turning them into short-term rentals, and they're not leaving any inventory for you and me to buy that beautiful home in Sedona. I want to get to RPG's comment here. RPG, do you think some of those metrics aren't as helpful? The reason behind 2008 are well-documented and not entirely based on sentiment. I think 2008 was just a matter of... Um, you know, people just lost their homes. I mean, the, the, their their payment adjusted. They got an adjustable rate mortgage. Gee, I've got a six hundred dollar a month payment on this beautiful home. Wait, now it's nineteen hundred bucks. They bailed, and then when that happened, people were afraid to buy properties. So the Cromford index just went down on both fact and sentiment. I think you're right. So the short term rental regulation bill returns. Legislatures tried to put in some language, and it failed. It didn't have any legs, and so. They've got some language returning here. <coughs> so here again, it says that Governor Doug Ducey touted as helping people who wanted to make extra cash by renting their house on Airbnb and other platforms would be repealed if GOP-sponsored bill letting cities and towns regulate their short-term rentals wins approval. I'm all about local control, whether it's federal coming in and telling us what our zoning laws want to be, which they're trying to do, I think that's all got to be a local decision. Look, if Sedona wants to heavily regulate their short-term rentals, I'm a cheerleader for that. I'm all for it. It's your, it's their town. It's not mine. We're, not, we're now trying to get a little bit of control back, says Representative John Kavanaugh of Fountain Hills. Um, so he's got a proposal out there. Now, John is a retired um, New York policeman. I met him out in Fountain Hills. His wife used to be the mayor out there. Kind of a funny guy. Uh, he's no dummy, though. His proposal would allow cities and towns to create residential use and zoning ordinances related to short-term rentals. It would also require all short-term rental owners to register the property with the city, town, or county, which must then report who owns the property to the Arizona Department of Revenue. It's a little deeper than that. When you have a short-term rental, you need to pay a transaction privilege tax, TPC, tra TPT. And uh, they run about 2 to 2.7%. So whether it's a short-term rental or long-term rental, you need to register it as a rental. And so they're requiring that. And But now they're going to add a layer on there that says, look, 
you have to register your short-term rental and register the contact information for that homeowner. Who's managing that place? So it's, it's Rick McCone. Here's his phone number. Because what they're running into is when they get noise complaints in these neighborhoods, they don't know who to call. There's no central registry. And they say, well, we're going to find you. Well, they don't know who to find. And uh, it's not readily available. So while there have been laws on the books, there just hasn't been any mechanism to do anything about it. So people really felt like their hands were tied. Um, Ducey touted the effects of barring local regulations, saying it would allow homeowners to earn extra cash to keep the government out of the way of entrepreneurs. However, Ducey said in the past that lawmakers will revisit short-term regulation. So he passed the law and he goes, look, we'll take another look at it. So the short-term rentals have become big business in Arizona communities like Sedona, for instance. There's more than 2,100 short-term rentals. I was wrong. I said 1,100. This is from airdna.co. Take a look at that when you get a chance. Airdna.co, not .com. Um, Scottsdale has more than 4,000 for rent. Now that's that's not 4,000 single-family homes. That's 4,000 short-term rentals. So it could be anything from a six-bedroom home to somebody just renting out a room in their house or a casita or a condo or a townhome. So it does not mean there's 4,000 single-home rentals. But short-term rental operators said the bill could negatively impact their lives. Eh. These are the very select few, said Brian Hastings, about the bad actors in the industry. Hastings' son was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, and he said without the income from owning short-term rentals, his wife would not be able to find another job. They're not talking about clamping down on them and making it to where it's impossible to do business. They just want to be able to say, there's some language that says, look, if you're advertising on one of these platforms that says it's sleep six, then it's sleeps six. If we see 15 in there, you're going to get fined. And the cities will have the right and they'll be able to implement that type of language. That's the first biggest thing that they're trying to fix is try to keep these homes from turning into huge Scottsdale party houses because that's a real noisemaker and it disrupts your neighborhood. So they want to put those that kind of language in. Um, they are finding that, um, that even when they see that there's 20, 30 people there and people call the police. The police are going through the records and go, well, I, don't even, I don't know who the landlord is. Some people have these things professionally managed. And so everything really gets muddied up. They're also trying to limit where you can have your Airbnb by city. So there may be certain neighborhoods where they're going to come in and kind of grandfather. Now, if you've got one now and it's in a condominium complex and they come in and they write it in the CCNRs, chances are they're going to have to grandfather you. If you've already purchased it, it's already an Airbnb. I don't think they can come in and just change the rules and now it's not a short-term rental. So they'll possibly, I think, regulate it to where they're going to grandfather it and you can keep it as your short-term rental. But as you're looking around the valley and you're looking at purchasing something to use as an Airbnb, do your research. Um, if you're in a neighborhood that's got an HOA, check with the CCNRs. If you're buying in a multi-family multi uh, property, make sure you do your due diligence. Bryce says, we decided against buying a home for us to buy a property zone for multiple rentals. I hope the short-term rentals stay unregulated, but I hate the party house situation. Um, that's the issue. I don't see that this is going to be regulated to the point to where it's not lucrative anymore, especially as we're heading into Super Bowl. Um, I think that's a good thing overall. I'm against regulations generally, but ordinances like that, I think, are fair and safe. I agree. And that's what the governor said. He goes, look, I'm going to say that you can't regulate this, but I'm going to say that we're going to come in and we're going to take a look and revisit this in case any problems come up because there's always unintended consequences. Now, next year, we have the Super Bowl. Those people that own Airbnbs anywhere in the Valley, as you know, when we had Super Bowl a few years back, People were leaving their houses and putting them up for rent and getting like $5,000 for the week. Um, so we get a lot of uh, tourist traffic coming in for the Super Bowl. I've got a nice 23-foot travel trailer, and it's new. And I'm trying to figure out where I can park that and use that as a short-term rental. If anybody's got any great ideas on where I can put that, hit me up. Because 
Like, why not make 300 bucks a night off a travel trailer instead of sitting in my storage area? So that might be fun. So Super Bowl's coming. Nobody wants their Airbnbs regulated, but nobody wants it to be a huge fireworks going off in the backyard, 19 cars in the front, and people drunk and having way too much fun. So keep an eye on it. Be careful. I don't see it squishing the industry. So I just wanted to make sure you saw that there were some changes coming. Other than that, take on the day and have a great week. And on your way out, smash that like button. Thank you.